So we wanted to take a look at some of the uh, challenges that occur as we try to use the internet and other communication technologies in our classroom. Um, one of the most fascinating pieces is that right now we're in the middle of a huge intersection. Um, we have many things changing all at the same time. Um, and one of the, the best pieces about all this is as a classroom teacher, we have the opportunity to help our students negotiate or navigate through this intersection uh, that's occurring between literacy and technology. Um, and this is pretty much a challenge also for us because on a personal level, we're all trying to figure out where we stand with all this. We're trying to figure out, you know, do we want to use e-readers? You know, we're, we're having those discussions about purchasing a Kindle and, you know, can we, can we continue to read off of an e-reader or do we want to go to the library and still need to get books? Um, so it, it's a challenge to be able to go through that on a personal level while at the same time being responsible for our students and the future that they will go out into. Um, there's enormous changes that are occurring to the, the reader. Um, you know, what it means to be a reader, the, the type of tools that a, that a reader would use, the activities that the reader is involved in. But on a very basic level, you got to think about what it means to be a reader. You know, this is a, a picture of, a, of a, one of the professors I work with. This is what she carries, you know, on a pretty regular basis. You know, you'll see a, a text on and reading and literacy. You'll see the Atlantic magazine. Um, actually has a little Palm Pilot there and a cell phone, a pretty basic cell phone, but the iPad and the Kindle reader. And this is pretty much what she's carrying on, a, on an everyday basis. Um, so, you know, a lot of our students come to school packed with the same sort of tools. Uh, and we need to be prepared for that. Think about the changes that are occurring to text right now. I mean, if you look at coming from cuneiform tablets and, and moving into, you know, printing of text on paper, you know, think about how revolutionary the, the, the Gutenberg press was, you know, think about being able to go to our, our school libraries and, and our local libraries and pull out any sort of text on any topic that you want uh, and, and how much of a, of a privilege and a liberty that is. And now we get to this point where you know, we have devices and even mobile devices, and that's where we do the majority of our reading. Um, and our students also, that's where they do the majority of their reading. Um, that's where they're, they're using the internet as a source for academic and personal search topics. Um, and so the, there are severe drastic changes that are occurring to just the very nature of text. There's also changes that are occurring to the activity of reading. Um, and this is this is very fascinating. I mean, basically, let's say there's a student that goes out online and they're searching for information about the Scarlet Letter. Um, they'll do like a, a very basic internet search. They'll come across Wikipedia. Most of our teachers train them that Wikipedia is a bad source, so they immediately back out of Wikipedia. They'll go off the dictionary.com and get info. Uh, they go to the internet movie database and look at pictures of uh, Sigourney Weaver. No, that's not Sigourney Weaver. Uh, I can't remember who that is. Um, but basically, then they'll back out and, you know, they'll go to primary source documents. Um, they'll go do image searches to figure out where this, you know, get other information and use multimodal sources to gather background info. Uh, this is shocking to me and probably to you as well, but some of our students might go to Sparknotes you know, and, and search to get more information about the text that they were supposed to read without having read it. Um, so, I mean, our students are negotiating all these multiple sources trying to get more info about a topic. Um, and, and it makes me wonder, you know, what are we doing to help prepare our kids for this sort of activity? Um, you know, usually in our classrooms, we have students look at one or maybe two sources of information. And very rarely do we have them bouncing back and forth all these different sources almost instantaneously. Um, additionally, what's also fascinating about this is that uh, Google identified an F pattern. Okay, so when we come across a website, what will happen is our eyes naturally go across the top of the page and then dip down and look into where we see links. Then they'll trail off a little bit more. Um, and so we make this F pattern pretty much within one and a half to two seconds. 
according to the, the research from Google. Um, and within one and a half to two seconds, we decide whether or not this website is something we want to spend more time reading. Um, and so that's a challenge as well. I mean, how many times do we ask our students to take a look at text and, you know, and read a, a piece of text and figure out um, what parts of it are important? Is this information important or not? And also, uh, what parts of the page might we want to ignore? Uh, so that's a challenge as well. Um, and so ultimately this becomes a question about how do we effectively and authentically reflect all these changes in instruction, you know, in, in how we work with our students um, in our classrooms using the internet and other communication technologies as a source. Um, and, and it is a challenge because a lot of the work that's being done in terms of how to use these technologies, there are multiple ways that we can view this work. Uh, there's new literacies research that informs how this would happen in our classroom. There's digital literacies, there's multi-literacies, there's techno-literacies. It ultimately is a, is a challenge to figure out how to best, you know, and how to most effectively and authentically reflect this in teaching and learning. Um, so uh, along with a colleague of mine, Greg McVeary, we've developed this online research and media skills curriculum. Uh, we developed a model that basically looks at three pieces, and we suggest that if you follow or if you have at least one element of your work or student work in teaching and learning, then you can say that you've authentically, effectively used technology or internet and communication technologies in your classroom. Uh, we identify this as online collaborative inquiry, online reading comprehension, and online content construction. Online collaborative inquiry uh, is basically, we define it as a group of local or global learners who arrive at a common outcome via multiple pathways of knowledge. In, in basic speak, this is a couple students working together to develop one text. So there's a, a couple great tools that are out there. I'm a big believer in free tools. Free is a great price point, at least for me. Um, and, and so there's some great tools out there that you can use. Wikispaces is a, is a wiki tool, a wiki editing and construction tool that I was introduced to by some teachers. Uh, Google Docs is a fantastic tool that I use pretty much daily. Google Groups is a way to host uh, some free discussion threads or a threaded discussion that you can use with your students. Um, and Blogger is a, is a blogging tool that's put together by Google. It's basically, you know, I use uh, Blogger. It's a way to have like a reflective journal that you can use with your students. Uh, I want to take a look at one of these and that's Wikispaces. Wikispaces is a, is a great tool. Like I said, it, it was introduced to me by uh, some teachers uh, at a workshop two years ago. Um, two of the things I wanted to show you first was uh, the, the link on a Wikispace tutorial. What it does is this link here is, is a tutorial that was put together on Wikispaces in Wikispaces um, by some previous students of mine. Um, it's great because it goes through pretty much all the nuts and bolts of what you need to know in order to create and edit a wiki. Uh, so if you have any questions on how to actually use Wikispaces, I would suggest using that first. Um, also, of course, you can go to YouTube and search for uh, tutorials on Wikispaces, and there's tons on there um, because there's a, a, a pretty close-knit group of teachers that use Wikispaces and provide support for others. Um, the, the other one that I want to show you is Classroom Debates. Um, this is an example of a way that we used wikis before uh, in a classroom. This is a high school population and what they did was they had groups of students. The library media specialists and the English teachers thought it was a challenge all the time to basically work with students to identify books that they would like to read. So in this situation what the teacher did was they put together one wiki page for each each text in the class and they would assign groups of students to basically fill out the page as a summary of books that they you know were reading or had in the library uh, the nice thing about this is that the groups of kids will work together and they start filling out the the page based upon in this case of mice and men um, and year after year this is something that you could send kids back to to basically discuss elements of the page that need to be edited or revised or fixed. 
Um, so, for example, in year one, you'd have students that would basically fill out all of this information, you know, and then year two, the teacher could say, okay, with a different group of kids, you know, I, you know, what I want you to do is take a look back at this page and figure out, first of all, is everything all correct up in this first section here? And then the second thing I want you to do is take a look at the theme section. This first theme on the, the American Dream is a little bit thin. I think that you guys can work to uh, improve upon it and build it up. Um, and then there's also nothing in the criticism section. So I want you to, uh, your third task will be to look through criticisms, you know, online and off of the, the, the book and then basically bring it back and let's talk about, you know, what's involved there and also add it to the wiki. Um, so that's one possible way that you could be using wiki spaces in your classroom with your students. Um, I have a quick video. This is research that we conducted, and this is some students researching online. They're involved in online collaborative inquiry, and the, the topic that they're doing here, that they're engaged in here, the inquiry topic, is looking at zoos. Are they cool or cruel? So they're all searching together. It's a seventh grade population. It's a one-to-one -one laptop classroom. Um, and, and that's not important, the fact that it's a one-to-one -one laptop classroom. What is important is the skills and the communication that the students have um, and, and the way that they're out online searching together and negotiating multiple forms of information to try and learn together to learn collaboratively. So if we were to continue on with that video, um, what you would notice is that the students, you know, are working together, they're looking across multiple websites, they're looking at blog posts to see whether or not people feel that zoos are helpful to animals or are, you know, once again cruel um, to animals. And they're looking together and they're working together to figure out what is being said about this online. Uh, and that could be a challenge for, you know, students to negotiate that and figure out how they ultimately feel about it. Um, but what you'll notice is one of the students was looking with another and, you know, pointing out pieces of their website that they, um, you know, that, that key them into how it would help them look at the topic. Um, so it's, it's basically students working together, researching together online. In that case, they were using, uh, a, I think, a Google Doc to share the information, but that could be easily information that's put onto a Wikispaces page. The next step that I want to look at is online reading comprehension. This is based on a lot of the work that I, you know, helped. Uh, I was involved in at the New Literacies Research Lab at UConn, um, and this is, you know, what we define it as. This is the the knowledge, skills, and disposition students need as they read online, and we define these skills as questioning, locating, evaluating, synthesizing, and communicating. Um, so when we look at online reading comprehension. Once again, there's a lot of great tools that are out there that are free that you can use and you can use with your students. Um, the first of which is Digo. Digo is a very powerful uh, tool that teachers use with students. You can basically annotate a website and give your students a key to the website so they can see what your annotations are. Um, it's a way to scaffold, you know, all learners of all abilities, um, you know, to help them figure out what's important or what you think is important on that website. Uh, Google Spreadsheets and Forms is a fantastic tool to use. You can create formative and summative assessments, uh, so students can go out online and take a, you know, take a survey or fill out a worksheet or fill out a homework piece um, or a reading journal using Google Forms. Uh, Google Custom Search is a way to build an online search engine that you basically scaffold off 
We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Evernote is a great tool that I use uh, pretty much four or five times a day. It's a way to create an online multimodal notebook. Um, you can basically save web pages and use it as a, one of my colleagues calls it an online trapper keeper. Um, but basically you can create a notebook um, that is available everywhere you can get online. Um, what I wanted to do is take a little bit more time and take a look at Google Custom Search. Um, a lot of times it's a challenge to go online and take a look at all these information sources and figure out what works best for you and for your students. Um, previously, a lot of us would go and we would create a hot list or web quests um, or at the very least, you know, create a, a, a Word doc that had hyperlinks to websites that you would want students to take a look at. Um, and this works very well, but part of the challenge is that we're pretty much eliminating a lot of the skills that provide challenge for our students as they read online. Um, so questioning and using keywords and revising keywords, uh, locating within search engine results or within a uh, list uh, within a specific web page, evaluation and synthesis of online information sources, we're eliminating all of those skills. Uh, and for some of our students, we might want to do that. The nice thing about Google Custom Search is that you can build an environment, scaffold it off, um, and you can select, handpick websites that might be a little more credible or a little less credible, um, or you might put in websites that will definitely help them with their topic, but they're still using an environment that looks like Google. Um, and, it, and this will help scaffold them so that later on they can go off uh, and be more successful. Now it sounds very challenging, um, but what I did was I, I worked on this with an elementary class before, and these students were, um, I think it was a second grade population, they were doing research on the 50 states. So it was groups of students, I think they were working in twos or threes, and they were researching different states, and they would compile information and add the information back to the class wiki. Um, and so this group that we're going to see here, they were taking a look at the state of Connecticut. So you can see it pretty much looks just like Google does. Um, and it's populated by us as websites from EnchantedLearning.com. Um, all of these websites we put in there, the teacher and I put in. Um, and this group specifically here, what they're trying to do is they're trying to find maps. Um, they're looking, like I said, their, their state was Connecticut. They're trying to find maps about the state of Connecticut that they can basically bring over to the wiki um, to help support the information that they've presented. So these, this one student here is ne negotiating Google custom search. Um, it looks just like Google. We sent them a link to go to, um, and we prefer that they use it instead of going straight to google.com. And you can see that the student here is using some of those online reading comprehension skills that are so important. They're going back in, they're revising keywords, um, they're searching through the search engine results and locating. Uh, they're also locating within a web page to see if it helps out uh, with their task. Um, but it's basically, you know, building in a lot of the online reading comprehension skills they'll need later on when they're working by themselves. Uh, the third piece that I like to take a look at is online content construction. Uh, this is one thing that uh, I worked on with, uh, like I said, my colleague Greg McFerry. Basically, we took a look at all the other ones um, and we tried to figure out a way that we could possibly, you know, we felt like there was something missing with online reading comprehension and the collaborative inquiry. We felt like we were missing the writing or the composition piece of everything. Um, you know, and to me, that was probably the most exciting part. You know, when I was teaching English language arts, is I wanted my students to work to write and compose and create. Um, and we felt like that was missing before. So we've been developing online content construction. And, you know, very broadly, we've defined it as the knowledge, skills, and disposition students need uh, when they're online and they're constructing or recreating or remixing or redesigning online texts. And in order to do that, they need to encode and decode meaning through the use of all these multimodal, multimodal tools that are out there online. Um, 
Once again, there's a lot of free tools that are out there that work very well for this. Uh, Google Sites is sort of like Wikispaces. You can create a website. Uh, your students can collaboratively create a website. Um, a lot of teachers use that for their classroom website, and it works very well. Um, I'm a big proponent of online video casts. Obviously, we're in the middle of one right now. Um, some of the tools that you can use uh, are Jing or Screencast-O-Matic works well. Screener is also a great tool. Um, and what students and teachers can do is they'll make video casts, little videos where they basically do think alouds. And they'll talk you through work that they've conducted or you know have completed and explain the thought process involved as they did the work. Uh, SoundCloud is a is an audio recording tool. I've used it with students before to create audio uh, podcasts. So you can create you can create a clip, an audio clip, and instantly share it online, and then use that as a way to annotate and um, edit and revise um, the audio clip. It's a very powerful tool. It basically makes podcasting, audio podcasting, very easy. Um, and then Storify is one that I wanted to take a look at right now. Storify, basically what it'll do is it'll go out online and it'll search through all the online informational sources and all the social media that's out there and it'll help you um, curate and create a story based upon all this social media. Um, and what's nice about it is that, you know, the truth of the matter is that there is a lot of information out there that is a little more credible and relevant and appropriate, and there's a little there's information out there that's not credible and relevant and appropriate. I'd suggest that Storify is something that you'd want to work on, you know, with a with a, a, a an older group of students. Um, it's something that you know you might want to work on with a high school population. It might be something that with a younger group of students, you create pieces in Storify. Uh, as opposed to having students create them. Uh, but it's very powerful because you can go online, look through all these so, you know, social media and informational sources that are available online, and you can pull all them together and put them into one story. Um, so what I wanted to do is take a look at, and I gave two links there. I'll go back very quickly. One is this piece that I did on um, the Mars rover Curiosity that landed. And you can see that I pulled in pieces from Wikipedia and an image uh, that NASA sent out. And then this is a, a tweet. Um, and then there's a video from YouTube that was in there. Um, this was a, a mashup, a, a piece from Instagram that somebody messed around with the photo and put Wally in. Um, and then I also pulled in the, the photo uh, from Flickr of the Jet Propulsion Labs and everybody celebrating. Um, I pulled in one of my own tweets um, from Zenny Jardin, um, where she basically said, I'm inside the press presser, eight NASA and JPL engineers and administrators on the podium, not one woman, let's change that. I thought it was a very important spin to put on what we're looking at. Um, you know, here is another piece from Instagram where somebody was messing around with photos from it. Um, I pulled a, a SoundCloud clip you know, of a, of a song called Curiosity by Milkshake Daddy to give you uh, an example of some of the expansiveness of online information. Um, and then, you know, wrapped it up with a couple Facebook and Twitter messages. A dead cat was found on Mars. Curiosity killed it. You know, ha, ha, ha. Uh, so basically, this is a good example of all of the different pieces that are involved in the story that's being told online. Um, and this other one was a, a, another link that I gave. It's a way that a, a teacher was documenting digital skills and, and things that we can teach our digital natives and, and effective ways to parent them. So it's a way that a teacher in a school wanted to document learning that was occurring. Um, and I have a, a clip in here on how do you Storify and, and what is involved as you create Storify it. Storify helps you tell stories with social media using tweets. Facebook posts, YouTube videos, Flickr photos, and other elements from the web. So, I mean, if you can go on and watch that video on your own. Uh, one thing, once again, it, you know, it does go out and search and scrape online informational sources and social media sources. It does go through and scrape Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and Flickr. And yes, there is some questionable information that's out there that you might not want in front of your students. 
I would suggest that this is something that, you know, if you're a teacher working with any grade level students, you initially go in and you test this out yourself. You can create a, a powerful stream of information where you can students, your students can look at various sources of various levels of credibility and relevance and then you basically have the opportunity to present those to them and have your students look across the stories and develop some of the skills they need as they look intertextually um, at different sources. Um, with later grades, maybe a high school population, you could have students start to build their own pieces. But I think it's a good way that you could look online and develop all these different pieces and take a look at different sources of information and maybe do it as an activity to lead into another activity, a way to build up prior knowledge, a way to work with your students to see what is being said out there. Um, you know, I've had teachers that use Twitter and they followed along with elections or they use Twitter to follow along with different worldwide events. Um, this is one way that you can take all those messages and pull them into one stream. Uh, Storify does a nice job of pulling it in and making it look nice and slick and what they call beautiful. Um, the truth of the matter is this is stuff that you can do anywhere. You can copy these tweets and Facebook messages and videos to a Wikispaces page or a Google Sites page. The nice thing about Storify is that it pretty much does it all for you in one package. Um, but I definitely recommend taking a look at it especially for social studies and language arts teachers, I think it could be a powerful tool. Um, so once again, I wanted to, you know, basically what we've looked at is, you know, online research and media skills, and, and we boiled it down to online collaborative inquiry, online reading comprehension, and online content construction. My colleague and I make the argument that if you have an element of at least, uh, at least one element of all of these three different aspects, then you can say that you are effectively and authentically using technology in your classroom with your students. Um, and we give some examples, but the truth of the matter is that there are millions of ways that you can use these elements in your classroom. There is a challenge, though, when we work with technology in our classroom and we try to build these skills in. And that's one of the challenges that we have is that a lot of times we look at ways to use these technologies in our classroom and we have this mentality, you know, the hovercraft mentality of, you know, we have a tool and therefore we should use it. The truth of the matter is all of this should go back to student learning objectives. We should take a look at how you want to use technology and how it makes what's happening better in your classroom. Um, what I do is I look at the technology learning cycle. I figure start with a lesson or a unit that you currently love and teach it well. Um, this is all edited from Sprague, Kaufman, and Dorsey. Uh, find ways to effectively embed the tech into the unit. Incorporate tech uh, infused lessons into a learning situation. Um, I think that teachers, after they test this out, they should go back and reflect. You know, we want to be healthy, reflective practitioners. I want you to reflect on the success of the lesson and most of all, share. Share with your colleagues, share with other people online. To that end, I think that teachers can also um, extend this learning. You can build uh, classroom and teacher websites, join some of the millions of personal learning networks that are out there online. Uh, Twitter is one of the, the biggest and probably most healthy and, and vibrant. Uh, utilize hybrid lessons or even try to flip your classroom. I'd also uh, heavily suggest that you examine and engage your school's acceptable use policy. Is it acceptable or not? Um, are you allowed to and supported if you do this sort of work? And then also encourage and I encourage and I, I urge you to assess your students' digital footprint. Provide opportunities for them to build it up over time and use it as an assessment tool. Um, as an administrator, I suggest that you know administration in buildings define technology as a literacy issue. It's not something that the teacher down the hallway has to teach. It's something that should be taught in every single classroom, in every content area. 
Um, obviously have a school-wide email system, uh, have a help desk with uh, a 20-minute rule, and basically what that means is if you're a teacher in the morning and you want to use one of these tools and a, a website's blocked, you know who to call and you'll get an answer. Uh, you might not like the answer, but within 20 minutes you should get an answer about why it's blocked and whether or not it can be unblocked so you can go on with your day. I suggest that administrators invest more time in professional development in the teachers they currently have than in technology and some more technological tools. Um, we cannot win when we fight a technological arms race and try to buy the newest, best, greatest gadgets that are out there. Uh, schools need to have and districts need to have a long-term one-to-one computing strategy. And I also encourage administrators to incur, um, basically assess students' digital footprint. Uh, have our students do work over time. Have them use threaded discussions and blogging so we can see what students are doing as they progress through the year and through their career. Um, so once again, we looked at online collaborative inquiry, online reading comprehension, and online content instruction. These are three ways to effectively and authentically integrate technology into your classroom. Um, and the trick is basically finding the best opportunities and the best ways to build this learning into what you do with your students. Uh, once again, my name is Ian O'Byrne. I'm an assistant professor here at the University of New Haven. You can get in touch with me by emailing me, uh, wioburn at gmail.com. I'm also available on Twitter. I share tons of stuff and tools and ideas um, on Twitter, and you can get in touch with me at any point. Um, and thanks a lot.